He's the minister of the New York Church. He's written one of my favorite books on prosperity, The Ten Demandments of Prosperity. If you haven't read it, you need to get a copy of it. But I always find, for me, in being a new minister, looking for new ideas all the time and new ways of approaching this teaching, this is one of the wonderful things that I enjoy about Dr. Stuart Grayson, that every time he speaks, he brings something new, something creative, something that I've never heard before. And I know that you're going to get some new, wonderful ideas from him this morning. His talk is entitled, Spiritual Treatment, the Philosophy and Practice. So let's give a warm welcome for Dr. Stuart Grayson. Thank you. Well, this is a lesson, and um, I like to think of it as that and not a talk. I'm going to uh, give you a kind of brief outline of what I'm going to cover, and then we'll go into it. Before I do that, though, I would like to uh, say that the title of the lesson is probably incorrect. And the title should be something more or less like the, the creative action of mind and the human mind as it moved through Ernest Holmes and through what became known as religious science and the science of mind. That's probably more of a description, but anyway, it's what we're dealing with here is much more than treatment, which most of you know about. Uh, it has to do with the philosophy, uh, with the perennial philosophy, with the concepts and the ideas that underlie religious science and underlie the whole science of mind way of functioning and therefore underlie and move through spiritual treatment. And I'm hopeful that I can give you uh, maybe one or two uh, new insights, and uh, perhaps uh, from this you may get a couple of books also you might want to read and go into for your own particular background. Anyhow, religious science really, as Dr. Holmes has uh, said again and again, is uh, essentially an integration and a synthesis of the religions and the spiritual philosophies of the world. And although this sounds uh, very intellectual, and even my approach here may sound at first intellectual, my whole purpose is not that. It is to inform and to communicate, and hopefully I will do so. But my whole purpose here is also to commune with you so that together we can have some enriching experience of consciousness, of nature, of our own spirits, and as the result, walk out of here feeling that maybe we've gotten a few new insights here or there, but we've had an experience of something as well. And so that's my object. Uh, we're going, I've divided this into three basic areas, and the first area we're going to talk about very briefly, or cover, has to do with myths, mystery, and mysticism. The second area that we'll cover, again rather briefly, is Quimby, Eddy, Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy, the Dressers, that's uh, Annette and Julius Dresser and their son Horatio, who uh, really helped to uh, found the New Thought Movement. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit related to these people about the wounded healer, which many of us have been, and in that sense about a shamanic or the shaman's way of functioning. Not getting too involved in that, but giving you a, a good 
view of, of our relationship to uh, these different areas. And then the third aspect of what we're going to work with and cover is Ernest Holmes, the religious scientist. Ernest Holmes, who developed the science of mind and who uh, was an avid reader, a profound thinker, as all of you know, uh, but someone who really delved into the ideas, the concepts, and the philosophies of the world, and then extracted them and digested them, put them really through the uh, internal mechanism of his mind that had been exposed to the modern American metaphysical movement that began in the mid-19th century. So that's what we're going to cover, hopefully, in this time. And uh, I have a feeling that you will find this uh, of some interest. Before we go into uh, beginning uh, just a little bit with uh, myths, I'd like to, I don't know if I can talk here. If you don't hear me, tell me and I'll come back here. I uh, drew this before. Can you hear me? Yeah, I I know in the rear where I was sitting uh, yesterday morning, I couldn't see this well, so I'm just going to describe it very briefly and then talk a little about this, because I'm really uh, talking about the end of our lesson at the beginning, and I want you to see that it all ties together, so you don't say, where is he? He's off in the Greeks or off here somewhere else, and what has that got to do with what we're doing here? Well, it has a lot to do with it. And uh, so I want to begin near the end uh, to talk about the profile of what we not only study but work with. I've just uh, drawn a line, an arrow, as it were, at either end. Uh, and I've written on the side the M I N D. This represents mind. Now, across the Mind. I've done a wiggly line with a little circle in the center. Now that little circle in the center is you. This is the threshold of consciousness. And uh, on the above side, I've written conscious, the awareness meaning conscious. Not the, I've written uncon, meaning unconscious. So unconscious includes subconscious. There's an arrow at either end. That means at the depths of our being, at about depths of our nature, at the depths of your unconscious, you are without end. At the top, I've drawn an arrow to indicate a similar thing, that at the conscious level, we're really without end. We can always learn more. We can always understand more. That's why we're here. We're here, yes, for inspiration. We're here to be with friends and, and have the, the comradeship of like-minded people. But we're also here to learn and to experience. And that, at this conscious side, that is ever able to expand and move on. Now. It's very easy to understand the wiggly line that means the threshold of consciousness, that you're in the center, and that on the, the upper side, you have a conscious mind, and on the lower side, you have an unconscious, which includes your subconscious area of mind. The reason I drew three of these wiggly lines, very often when I've done this in class, uh, in New York, I only one line, and I pull above the conscious below it. Subconscious or unconscious, the wiggly line is the threshold of awareness, and there we are. But this drawn three, now all of it, of course, is mind. It's divided in order to understand function, in order to understand the department within the whole. But I do three lines. Because it shows that the deeper your mind 
your threshold of awareness goes into the unconscious, the more you can go deep into yourself, into the unconscious, also and simultaneously, the more conscious you awareness you have of yourself and of life. And that's why healing takes place through spiritual mind treatment. Because the more we go into the depths of our nature and of our being through meditation and through treatment work, especially that is the specific method or methodology, the more we go into our unconscious, the more aware we are of a conscious world reflecting all of this. Our conscious world expands because you're going deeper and deeper. There's a much longer line of the conscious. There's more expansion of conscious awareness. So we go deep into ourselves in our work. We do uh, spiritual mind treatment, which as you all know, will either be argumentative or realization treatment. And that helps us to get deeper and deeper into ourselves. And that not only works with the depths of our nature and being, but it helps us on a conscious level, not only experience greater health, greater wealth, or greater love, or greater, greater creative self-expression, but also a greater awareness of who we are and what we are in the universe. So that's the essence of the work and the rationale behind what we're doing here. It's also the rationale behind the science of mind. To get more and more aware of our minds, of ourselves, to get deeper into ourselves, to be willing to experience ourselves, in part to be willing to surrender to this greater potential that is there in life, and thereby to experience a greater outreach and a greater uh, awareness of the glories of nature. In preparing uh, for our lesson uh, mentally and, and uh, emotionally early this morning, I looked out at the horizon before sunrise and I sat on my bed. And I, to the horizon, as it were, just gave the, the eastern salute, which when, you know, it's high here, it's to the God out there. Often when we do it to someone, it's the God, in, we, we don't do it, but when they do that, some, some of us do, though. Uh, <laughs> we salute the God in you. Well, I sat on my bed. And because I had been thinking in terms of the gods and goddesses uh, that have come through mythology and legend, I found myself naturally, because the dawn was beginning to come, and naturally and automatically, which is in a certain sense not like me, I put my hands together. And I felt at one with all those people thousands of years ago, in India, for example, who salute, saluted Surya. Surya is the name for the Sanskrit name for the sun. But also for the ancient Egyptians and the other, uh, the Greeks, of course, and the other areas of uh, mind expressed through cultures and spiritual philosophies, who recognized in the sun God, but really God the symbol, the symbol of light, the symbol of illumination. I sat on my bed and I did this and I felt at one, not with the outer religion, not with the myth, not with the legend, not with the external, but with what was deep in the heart and in the feeling the minds, the consciousness of the individuals who were seeking, who were searching, 
who are looking for that answer to life. And so, there are many stories and many legends and many uh, uh, ways of thinking about life and about truth. And if we study the, uh, the religions of the world and the philosophies, the spiritual philosophies of the world, uh, we can see that these myths and these legends really try to not to initiate people, which was part of what they did, but to initiate them into a way of thinking, into a way of looking at life, and to impel them to action. Because uh, myths really exist uh, to impel people to action. We have to remember that a myth is not a truth. A myth only points to the truth. And all the stories, for example, that many of us uh, learned about of the Greek gods and goddesses and the myths and the legends were all these magnificent ideas living like human beings, having all the experiences of human beings so that they could point to a way of thinking and functioning. From the mansion on Mount Olympus, the gods cried out, O oh, Zeus, or he was the god of gods, O oh, Moira, the goddess of fate, it's all your fault that we have all these problems because they were, as you know, related to one another and interrelated and all kinds of experiences uh, were happening in these relationships, and they were pro crying out uh, to Zeus and Moira at their misfortunes, at the negatives in life, at the experiences they've had and uh, were having. And Zeus protests, and he says, human misfortune results from human folly. That's the science of mind, is it not? We know whether we're conscious of it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, that the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, which is the way Shakespeare put it, that these misfortunes, that the sicknesses and the inharmonies and the problems have come about through human folly, really meaning the way we are living, thinking, feeling, relating, functioning, the way we are using consciousness, the way we are using our organisms. And so, if you uh, go into all legends, you will you'll get the essence of a perennial philosophy which underlies our religious science, which when understood or when we begin to perceive it, gives us a greater faith, a greater conviction that we are indeed working with the way of life that we're flowing with the tide of spiritual integrity, that we're not some little group, some little 150-year-old uh, cult or whatever you want to label us, new thought, that uh, uh, some people would like to pigeonhole us as being very materialistic and very limited in our thinking and not terribly deep. We're as deep as the deepest Sanskritic philosophy. We're as profound and as deep as the mysteries that come out of Greece, ancient Greece, and we are as profound as the modern concepts and ideas that have been brought forth through Dr. Ernest Holmes. Everything that we are dealing with here has to do what is labeled the numinous. 
And the numinous has to be contrasted to another Latin word, nomen. The numinous means the sacred, the spiritual insight, the spiritual awareness that is deep within each human being. Nomen has to do with a name. It has to do with a god, or maybe a goddess, or a savior, someone out there. And our work is not interested in saviors out there. Here, each person is his, her own savior. We're not interested in nomen. Well, we were working with that before in the, in the earlier lesson, repeating, I am this and I am that, in the affirmation. But we're, in, the, in this lesson, we're thinking more in terms of the numinous. And that is the sacred that is behind everything, within everything, that enables us to say, I am a creative intelligence in action, and all these wonderful affirmations that, that uh, we were saying. Enough about myth. It's just a taste to direct you possibly to further study and insight, and not, when you do this, to get lost in mythology, but to see it as a means for deepening your awareness of who and what you are as a spiritual being living in a spiritual universe with the capacity to bring forth the greatest that any human being has brought forth up to this point in time and space. And since we're all part of a creative process, which we've learned, to be able to bring forth more and yet more and yet more and yet more so that we see ourselves as ad infinitum, without end, always ready to taste more, touch more, experience more, and let more be revealed to us. All of this has to do with spiritual awakening, spiritual awareness, spiritual realization. It has to do with what I have here. Because the deeper we go here, the more on the conscious side, we're going to find ourselves expanded. Now let's go just for a moment into the mystery religions and the mystery uh, healing cults. Particularly in ancient Greece, the great god was Asclepius. There were many temples to Asclepius, but of course there were many temples to many of the gods and goddesses. But what they practiced in Greece was incubation. Now, incubation is this method of taking the patient. Incubation was mostly related to people who were ill. But you know, among the Greeks, it was very interesting. They uh, considered health directly connected to, interrelated with wealth. And sickness directly related to and interrelated with poverty. We treat, say, for prosperity. And the ignorant out there who really don't know a hill of beans about philosophy or anything say, oh, you're so materialistic, you're praying for money and you're praying for this. It's all part of the same thing, and it's very ancient. So, they took the sick person and brought that person into the temple for incubation. They would sleep there. And during the sleep, they would have dreams. Or if they were too nervous and too excited because they're in the temple of Asclepius and they're going to be healed, or hoping that that's what would happen and they can't sleep, then they were expected to have visions or some kind of, of uh, oracular experience. And many, many people did. Their dreams revealed to them their state of consciousness, and simultaneously they were healed. 
And there was much healing in these temples. There was one temple, and I believe it was near the Oracle of Delphi, where the people went through a, a kind of tunnel. And there were holes alongside. And there were members of the temple who would whisper or talk through these holes to the people that are coming, were coming through. And they would say, you are whole. Harmony is happening now. And they would get through this. By the time they went out, they were filled with a whole new belief system, a whole new consciousness, yes, because of suggestion, and yes, because their mental equivalent of response from the universe, from the gods or goddesses, was increased and there is only one law of mind, it operated, it reflected, it responded, and the people were healed, blessed, and benefited. Uh, there were other areas of religion uh, that is in what can be called the mystery religions. They all have to do with birth and death. Really, in a certain sense, it's with death and rebirth. Uh, always you have the goddess and the god that suffers and that is risen. You have the mother goddess and you have the consort who goes through some experience, dies, and then is reborn, usually in the spring, and celebration, renewal, the experience really of the serpent. And that's why Asclepius has a staff with a serpent wound around it. And you see that, you know, all doctors take the, that, uh, or they used to accept that creed. Because the serpent gets rid of its skin, and that means rebirth, it means healing, it means renewal, and it means eternity. And that's the story of the gods and goddesses and this whole action. And it's very familiar, isn't it? We're coming up to Easter now. And what Christianity took over. So very quickly, the Phrygians had Sibylle and Attis, the great, of course, uh, mother goddess and the, the development of the rebirth through Attis. This was a religion that spread through the Mediterranean and for the first and second centuries of the Christian era, it was vital and very alive. Then you began to think about those who were taking not metaphysical, but literal ideas, literal concepts of religion, and getting confused by that. Anyway, very briefly and very quickly, in Syria we had Aphrodite and Adonis, in Egypt, Os uh, Isis and Osiris. Uh, in Persia, Mithra. Mithra was the great hero god who is closest to Jesus Christ. The whole story is similar with his ascension to heaven, his helping the devotees and the followers who would be battling Satan, and his bringing renewal and regeneration. All of this is part of a creative action of mind moving through the universe that you and I are working with today in a very practical way and not in some religious cult way that we see throughout the world even today. Now mysticism. Mysticism really has to do with getting a sense of the sacred. Back to the numinous. The sacred that is all around us and within us that we can see in the rising of the sun as I had experienced this morning. Not looking at the sun and saying, well, Stuart Grayson worships the sun god. I know somebody's going to say that. 
Do, do you know about him? A little off now. <laughs> Happens to some of them, you know, when they study the science of mind, they go too much into the absolute. They go berserk. <laughs> but I was really appreciating the state of mind and the state of consciousness that operated through these people. And I was seeing the numinous, not the gnomon. I could care less. Of, well, I like the sun, but <laughs> sun, you're okay. But, but um, I was not concerned with the externals. That's what I'm talking about. More with internals. So mysticism has to do with the sacred. Now, the lessons taught by mystics, I boiled down in, uh, let's say, I've got seven points. And I think the, these are important because they directly relate to what we do if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. The first uh, thing that a mystic does is look for the reality within. We talk about the reality, or the single reality, or the infinite or creative mind. So the first is to look for that reality within. The second point is to find meaning in mystery. And that's where many mystics are involved in forms of uh, worship and in forms of uh, search, looking into the unknown, but not in terms of mysterious as we think of mysterious, but the mystery, the, the vast, thinking in terms of the vastness, the infinitude of nature and of being and of life and of the self, so that one can ask the question, where have I come from? What am I now? Where am I going? What is life about? And relate it to something that is of the mystery, but that instantaneously, by the mystic, when the question is asked, when the outreach is there, there comes the answer. There comes the response out of life. In our work, we say uh, so frequently, when we give the word to the law, we know in the law, the law immediately responds. Throughout all time, among all mystics, they may not have said it this way, but they knew that there would be a response to something, to the higher power, to the greater force. And they were surrendered to that, meaning they were beginning to become aware that the great creative intelligence was out there and in here and working through them. Well, that is the second point. The third is to discover the eternal in the temporal. Something that students of science of mind are doing all the time. Our treatment is related to discovering the eternal in the temporal and understanding perfect God, perfect man, perfect being. Understanding our divine resource. Understanding why we can do treatment and expect a result. Understanding why there is something that's so vital in this work, but more about that later. The fourth point, that the mystic appreciated solitude, because the mystic knew that the world was focusing their attention on people, places, things, situations, and events. These were a vortex of energy that drew them out of themselves. And in doing that, they could get lost in a person, or persons, or things. In other words, the world of effects could capture them because it captivated them, and because, after all, they are part of the world of effects. But in solitude, we can move into the numinous. So that is another very important point. They appreciated solitude. The fifth point was that they found joy in serving. Joy in giving. In being, of course. 
but being connotes action or activity. Being really is doing. It's a state of action, so they must serve. What do they serve? They serve life. They serve God's perfect creation, perfect action. And most serious students of our work get to a point where they're very willing to serve, to help a friend, to say, may I do a treatment for you, or let me give you this book, or let me help you. What do you think all the giving of books is about? And pamphlets. And we joke about the people who are trying always to convert other people and talk to them. But behind all of that is an essential part of our nature. And that is that when we grow in being, we are giving. And so it has to do with serving. The, the sixth point is that they honored humility. Humility because they knew there was a higher force a greater power that operated within them. Surely they were the sons and daughters of the king, but they were not the king. And I think this is an area where, as religious scientists, some people in the early stages make a mistake and they start to think in terms of their being the creator of the cosmos, of the universe. I am God which is absolutely a correct statement. But we are God individualized. And therefore, gods and goddesses to our worlds. And we sometimes bring, bring blessing and sometimes cursing. And we recognize that as gods and goddesses to our worlds, we are God individualized and therefore, we have the whole creative process, as it were, in our hands, ready to work with us and through us. The seventh and final point is that all mystics sought, and they also see, that one love as supreme. Particularly, we're familiar with this mystic way of love as supreme in, in Christianity, but it exists everywhere. It's existed through all the philosophies. Very briefly, in the mystic way, there are four basic steps. And you cannot divorce them from what we do. The first is awakening. Awakening to waking up awakening to the fact that there must be more than what appears to be. This, and I want to go through this very briefly because time is rapidly going out and I want to get to some of the other points. Uh, the second is what is called purgation. But purgation is really purification. And purification is what we do in spiritual mind treatment when we say, no, not this, yes, I'm that. I'm a child of the universe, a child of God. I'm not a victim. I am not a concept of lack, loss, or limitation. That's purgation. The fourth, or third step in the mystic way is illumination. And that's what we work for in all of our treatment work and all of our study, is to get, what do we call it, realization. And realization connects with with this fourth point that I will bring up, which doesn't always exist in the mystic way, but it is connected with it. The illumination has to do with, with releasing to the great law of life, to the law of mind. And in the mystic way, it can be, and is often labeled, unification. That's not our term, because we use unification as an early part in treatment work. But in the mystic way, unification is when there is a complete awareness that I am God, individualized, in expression. Very well. Just to conclude this part, there are four types of mystic. And uh, you can relate yourself to any one of the four or to all four. The four aspects work in all people. 
and everyone who is studying uh, religious science and the science of mind and certainly working with treatment is in some way experiencing some of these areas. To uh, investigate them is your own personal choice. And uh, to read books in these areas, again, your personal choice. I only say that if you do investigate further, if you do read books, and I will perhaps name a few, uh, then you must be sure to keep your Science of Mind textbook by your side and use that glossary actually with a concordance to look up certain words to be sure that you keep very clear as to what we mean versus what certain um, medieval texts are saying, uh, for example. Well, all right, very quickly, there are four types of mystic. The first is the contemplative. Generally, these were just generally now, not everyone, but generally, these were monastic people, people in, in uh, communities of nuns and, and monks who were living and meditating. And you have people like St. Augustine, Eckhart, and Emerson, great contemplatives, who in turn did write, but we'll go into some books in a minute. That's the first. The second is personal mysticism. And this is where... The individual has a, an interest in and focuses on communion with God, or say communion with Christ. Well, Jesus did this, Paul did, Luther, Thomas Akempis, George Fox, the founder of the Friends, Society of Friends, and the great French mystic Fenelon. The third uh, type of mystic is a nature mystic. Uh, this is... Um, where nature is seen as infiltrated with everything religious and mystical and spiritual, where there is a, a just a feeling that God is through it all, working through it all. And of course, we know of St. Francis, who is the great exponent of this, Wordsworth, a great poet who, uh, with other poets, wrote about nature and the beauty of the divine that is flowing through it all. And the uh, writer, John Muir, who, again, had the sense of the divine through nature. And then finally, the fourth, uh, the practical mystic, you might call it. This is the mystic who serves through love and action. Actually, Christians are predominantly uh, this fourth type of practical mystic. And so uh, you've got uh, Paul and Augustine again and St. Francis, St. Bernard, Eckert. Uh, you've got Jacob Burma, St. Teresa, Pascal. You've got Wesley, Philip Brooks, or Phillips Brooks, and of course our own Ernest Holmes, who was in every sense the practical mystic. Now the result of this sense of unity with the one, was that many of these people had spontaneous combustion going inside of them. Uh, you and I have had experiences like that when we get some insight about something, about ourselves, about another, about a way to go. We might say, well, I've been guided from within. They had these spontaneous combustions, and they came out in writings. And some of them you see very clearly in the Psalms and in Isaiah and the Bible, look in the confessions of St. Augustine. Dante's Divine Comedy, a fantastic mystical book called the Theologica Germanica, The Imitation of Christ, William Penn's, our own William Penn's Fruits of Solitude, Towler's Sermons, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Milton's Sonnet on His Blindness, John Woolman's Journal, Whittier's Hymns, Thompson's Hound of Heaven. This is just that brief overview, and some of these books will certainly be able to help you and tie you in to uh, what we're doing. In examining those who have been a means of helping others, 
healers literally through being able to do physical healing and healers as being able to uh, emanate something and to be able to be a point of challenge and change for individuals. In most inst instances, they've been people who've had problems or people who've been di in difficulty or pre people who've been sick and who, even as they are helping others, have continued to have these problems. Quimby, though you don't read much about it, had challenges on a physical level. Actually, they grew as he was a healer. And I understand that that was one of the major reasons why he stopped doing the work he did. Quimby, most of you know about, I'm not going to go into the details of his life, but he was the man who uh, was the means through which a certain form of suggestion and suggestion therapeutics developed in the latter part of the 19th century in New England. Mary Baker Eddy, who was Mrs. Patterson at that time, was his student and patient, as was uh, Annette and Julius Dresser. These people were sick, and they came to Quimby and were healed. Their healing was an integral healing, a real healing, not just a cure. Healing means transformation. Healing means no relapse because you get to the state of consciousness where there has never been a lapse in the first place. So that means freedom and ease. Cure is symptomatic. It has to do with symptoms and changing of symptoms, and very often they go away for a while and they come back. Anyhow, as the result of Quimby, we have Mrs. Eddy, who took some of these ideas and put them into a format as an individual in constant struggle with her own well-being, by the way, the wounded healer who was able to put her understanding of Quimby's ideas that developed through a, a new state of consciousness into a whole method and into a process that is very related to what we do. And she developed a religion called Christian Science. The whole reason why Christian Science prospered is because it is a dynamic action of consciousness. Even though in these days we know that it's on its way out, it is only on its way out because it had its proper and appropriate place in time, in evolution. New thought was the other branch that came out of this wounded healer of Quimby. And that moved through the dressers. It moved through um, Warren Feld Evans, who was a Swedenborgian minister, also an ill person, also someone who was healed by dresser, also someone who began to talk a great deal about the prospering action of creative intelligence and the creative process in the individual. And of course, this developed through many different groups and of course, up to our present time and we're part of the New Thought Movement, as we all know, and we talk in terms of uh, religious science as being that part of the movement which has it the, the most, the clearest articulation of the methodology of spiritual treatment. You move on to the current interest in the shaman. Basically, shamans have always existed. And in a certain sense, we're all shamans who are working on ourselves and being vehicles, avenues, and channels, not channelers, but channels of the creative energy to flow. Although channelers also uh, might be that, except that channelers don't realize that they're dealing with this part of themselves and not some uh, disoriented or disenfranchised, or I don't know what to label this so-called entity that think, they think is moving through them and speaking through them. Sometimes brilliant ideas come through and sometimes a lot of junk comes through them. The, the shaman among the American Indian is an individual who goes through a period of change sometimes or from time to time in a sweat lodge 
where there is, and sometimes with the use of drugs, there is an attempt at bringing about a change of consciousness so that that change of consciousness will bring about an inner transformation so that there will be an outer transformation which will be called either healing or spiritual awakening and awareness or a movement of themselves into a new world of experience in life, in being in life. Most shamans are wounded healers. Shamans are notorious for being sick and getting well, being sick and getting well. Their belief structures, you see, are very oriented to individuals who are not whole and their being not only in sympathy with these individuals who are in need of being, becoming well, and we certainly are in sympathy with people here in our work, but they empathize with that. And in empathizing with that problem, they descend to the level of the problem and take it onto themselves. Many of them even write like this when they've written little treatises and talk in these terms of how this happens. And naturally, they can't last too long without going down. Then they recuperate, the wounded healer gets better, and then they're able to uh, express and to move out. The mystic way is the way of religious science. And I'd like now to talk a little bit about what we're doing here. Dr. Holmes has talked about the levels of consciousness. He's made all of this very simple. He says we've got a conscious mind, we've got a subconscious mind, and then he talks about something, doesn't speak about it as this that much, but it is throughout the textbook, he talks about the Christ consciousness. So we understand that we've got conscious and subconscious, but that all of this is in something beyond, something larger and something greater, which because Christianity comes from that Judaic Greek, I have to put it that way, background. The Christos is involved. And it is the Logos, the Word. And so Dr. Holmes is trying to show us that we have a conscious mind, a subconscious mind, that they interact, and one works as a law responding to the other, all of this most of you know, but that there is a supreme logos, that there's a supreme action which is called the Christ consciousness. Now this is the consciousness of illumination and also of the mystic's unification. It's the highest moment and it's when Dr. Holmes in that wonderful little treatise called Sermon by the Sea. I'm sure many of you have read it. And he's giving a talk at a church somewhere in California, dedicating it, and he stops in the middle. And he says, do you see it? Do you remember that? Do you see it? The light? And he has an experience of what can only be labeled Christ consciousness, where he's been exalted in his consciousness, where he's having an inner and an outer transformation, and it's projected outwardly through him, in a sense, as this new vision, as the new light, as the new awareness. Dr. Holmes has tried to show us, for our treatment effectiveness, 
that there is a prototype for everything that there is in this world. For every cell in your body, there's a prototype. For every organ, every function, every action, a prototype. The prototype among some psychologists, and certainly, again, looking back to the Greeks, is really what they call an archetype. It is a divine pattern. So that when I was thinking about this divine pattern, which is the perfect pattern behind anything and everything, I was thinking about the Lord's Prayer. And I thought how we could take an organ and interpolate it through the Lord's Prayer. For example, my eyes, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. My liver, which art in heaven, my brain, my nose, which art in heaven, that exists as a perfect pattern, as a perfect prototype, in the Supreme Consciousness, it is hallowed, it is whole, it is sustained, it is maintained, it is retained in its perfect beauty and order, in its perfect archetypal image. And we say in our work that perfect life, which is God, is my life now. What is Dr. Holmes famous, I call it his famous mantra, or mantra. There is one life, that life is God, that life is perfect, that life is my life now. The life that is whole, that is perfect, complete, and free, is in that heavenly realm, that realm of consciousness, of harmony and wholeness, that's my life now. And this understanding and this awareness is what is the underlying factor in spiritual treatment. It is that which moves philosophy into practice and moves through the practice and comes through the patient, you, me, the individual you try to help, as the inner and the outer change or transformation. It's all related to a vast perennial philosophy. It's all related to a world of action and reaction and continual movement that has been at work since recorded history. We are the evolute of a historicity of homo sapiens, of humankind, with its philosophies and its practices refined and developed to a point where we have a right to go out and to say, I am not of this world, but I am in the world bringing light to the universe. And each one of us if we are really sincere in our work and doing our work, is a light bringer, a light giver, a light expresser. And we do it as the mystics appreciate it, with humility, because we know it's the gift of the great spirit of all nature and of all being that's around us and within our soul. Dr. Holmes makes another very important point he is telling us again and again, talk to God. Talk to God, not at God. And he means that we need this dialogue with the great spirit. And a dialogue is always two-way action. We speak the word and God speaks the word. God's word spoken through treatment is an answer always, is a response. 
from the depths of nature, the divine nature, the originating nature, as Trowood would put it, the wholeness that is in us all. Another very important point that we have to always remember, and Mrs. Eddy knew this, but her problem was that she got too involved in the effect world, believe it or not. She got too involved in mortal mind, in the human condition, which then brought about lots of fear and lots of phrases like malicious malpractice and malicious animal magnetism. These are all antediluvian words. You know, they, they come out of, of the late 1800s. But all that means fear. How wonderful that we've been birthed through the, the midwifery of Ernest Holmes into fearlessness, into recognizing one of his essential points, which he says is to look at a problem or a person or whatever it may be. She knew this, Eddie knew this, but she got lost, as I said. And he said, resolve it, resolve the thing or the person into a thought, into a state of thought. It's a state of consciousness. Then work with a thought. Then work with a consciousness. And through your word, through your understanding, you will be able to bring about a complete change in the thing through the thought. So that to us, thoughts are very important. States and stages of consciousness are very important. And we learn again and again to remind ourselves, what's the problem? What do I need? It's always an idea, always a thought that needs to be changed, a new idea that needs to be understood and accepted. And this is the, the real love feast. It's the real communion. It's the real love feast. It's the real celebration of the Mass and of the Last Supper. It's the taking in of the host. It's the whole thing. Because we absorb it and experience it as freshness, pur purification, and as renewal, and regeneration, and revivification, and healing, and blessing, and benefit. I'm almost through. One moment. In our treatment work, what we're really doing is to support our position that God is all there is. And the treatment leads us again to a new insight, again, to a new understanding, again, a better understanding, to a new action that brings about what we call realization. It leads to realization. Treatment is never never of its self-realization. It leads to realization. And then we see the inner and outer change. And we recognize that the life principle is the healer. Religious science and the science of mind have to do with change. Change means healing. Spiritual treatment is an action, a method that we use, our way of prayer, if you will, uh, that enables us to bring about inner and outer transformation and healing and blessing and benefit to ourselves and to all in our worlds. It is rooted in the philosophy of the ages. It is the new evolute for this moment at this time. It is doing its proper work. We need to be sure that we do our proper work day by day, each day, so that we can be that great light which we think about and talk about, which is that supreme, in perfect action. This ends our lesson, and I thank you very much. You've been very attentive. Thank you. Good. Thank you.